A big theme that has emerged for the Giants this year is the need to get younger and more athletic moving forward. Now, Wilmer Flores doesn't necessarily fall into that category of younger or more athletic, yet he has proven to be just a vital part of this team, both on the field and in the dugout and in the clubhouse. And today we learn that the Giants have locked him up to a two-year extension to avoid uh, having him reach free agency at the end of the year and potentially walk away. So we'll get into Wilmer Flores' contract extension next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on this show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday, talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thanks for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. And coming up on today's show, a lot to get into, and starting with the Wilmer Flores contract extension. This is We've been talking quite a bit over the last month plus about how Wilmer Flores is a free agent at the end of the year, and while the Giants have this general need to get younger and more athletic, doesn't doesn't apply to Wilmer Flores, in my opinion. I mean... It does apply. It'd be nice if he was younger and more athletic, but at the same time, his value is clear to this team. And at the All-Star break, I named him their first half MVP because he's just been such a consistent player for the Giants. It's funny because I was really talking about this in the last week or so, and then he went into this deep kind of funk over the course of a few games. I think he went hitless in the doubleheader, not just hitless, but he didn't get on base at all. And then I think the next day he went over. And so he went into this little funk, but then broke out of it with a big home run last night on Sunday Night Baseball. But regardless, we're talking about small samples there. And the Giants do, in fact, give him this extension. And so it is a, a uh, increase in pay for Wilmer Flores from what he was making over his first three seasons in San Francisco. It was initially a two-year, $6 million deal that had a $3.5 million club option for 2022, and the Giants picked that up. So it ended up being three years, $9.5 million through this season starting in 2020. But that was up at the end of the year. So this new contract extension is for $13 million over two years, and there's suppo- supposedly a mutual option for a third year. So when all is said and done, Wilmer Flores could end up being with the Giants for six seasons under these two contracts. So it's simply six and a half million in 2023 and six and a half million in 2024. So it's almost double what he's making this season. And I think it's deserved. The last contract was a little bit, they were paying him more like he was a platoon player, but he's kind of emerged as more of an everyday player. That being said, not necessarily someone you want to have to rely on to be every day in the middle of your lineup, but at the same time, he ends up, because he's versatile, he's not the best defender anywhere, but he can play third, he can play second, he can play first, he can DH, probably shouldn't play shortstop, and he doesn't for the Giants, but he moves around the diamond, and really, he hasn't had platoon splits in his Giants career since 2020, uh, which is when he joined the Giants. He's got 398 plate appearances against left-handed pitching and a 115 weighted runs created plus, meaning about 15 percentage points above league average. League average is always 100. So 115, significantly better than average against lefties with a strikeout rate of 17.8%. And then if we look against right-handed pitching, a 109 weighted runs created plus. So that's not really a platoon player at all. There's definitely some... Uh, improved performance against lefties in these numbers, but at the same time, above average against both. And interestingly, the strikeout rate is just 14% against righties. Normally, when we see someone with 
big platoon splits, which he doesn't have. But normally when you look at platoon splits, you're going to strike out more against same-handed pitching. Flores, a right-handed batter, you would think would strike out more against right-handed pitching, but he doesn't. Only a 14% strikeout rate against same-handed pitching. That's very low. So that's one of Flores' skills is, is that he makes a lot of contact and he can hang in there tough against righties and lefties. But just overall, when you look at what has he done with the San Francisco Giants, it's a 111 weighted runs created plus in 326 games, 4.1 fan graphs wins above replacement. And if you divide this total plate appearances he's had with the Giants in half, he has 1172, so 1,172. If you cut that in half, it's about a full season season's worth of plate appearances, about 600. And that would be about two fan graphs wins above replacement per 600 plate appearances, which is roughly league average. And so on the one hand, it's tempting to say, okay, so he's roughly a league average player. On the other hand, he's a little bit of a unique player. So I don't really want to put him in that category of just saying he's an average player because he doesn't get to being average in an average way, if that makes any sense. His overall value might be average of a everyday player, but he's kind of a unique player at the same time. And he's also just quite consistent. And we've seen many Giants players, Jock Peterson this year, Brandon Belt in years past, have been quite streaky. They'll go cold for two months at a time and then get really hot for a month. But for Flores, the whole time he's been with a, with the Giants, he's just pretty darn consistent. And he's always good for a tough at bat in a big situation. And he's got that pull power. He's hit 48 home runs with the Giants here in 326 games. So per season, that's an average of about, I mean, per 600 plate appearances, it's an average of about 25 per 600 plate appearances. So he's going to get somewhat close to 600 plate appearances this year, and he'll probably hit about 20 home runs. So I, I don't know. That was all about his play on the field. He's not the best defender, as we know, but he can be solid, I think, at second base particularly. And he's not the best runner, and he's not getting any younger. He is already 31 years old. He turned 31 in August, so he'll be 31 for most of 2023 and 32 for most of 2024. So it's not like he's super old or anything. But just what he means to the team from like a leadership standpoint and just from an attitude standpoint. And just I, I think that Giants fans really appreciate this guy, and he's been really well liked and appreciated everywhere he's gone from his time with the Mets and the whole crying when he thought he was traded thing. And then his time with the D-backs, though it was brief, I think they appreciated him. And now here in San Francisco, he's become one of the most well-liked players by fans. And I think in the clubhouse and in the dugout as well. So I'm very happy about this. I think it sets them up very nicely for next year because they do have, as we're going to discuss in a minute, some talented younger players, like guys who showed up in this series against the Cubs. So you add some of your young talent. I'm not saying you're you're in the best position ever, but you've got some young talent, and then you kind of need these solid veteran players too, and then you've got to supplement that with some more impact talent. So that's what the Giants are missing is the impact talent. But guys like Flores, maybe Jock Peterson, and then some of the younger players is a good place to start, I think. And so this is a good day for the Giants. And in a minute, we're going to talk about these 25 and 26-year-olds who made an impact in this series in Chicago and kind of point towards perhaps better things to come for the Giants in 2023. So all of that in just a second. But first, as you gear up for fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience, so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. 
All right, as promised, I want to get into these 25 and one, there's four 25 year olds and one 26 year old who made an impact in this series in Chicago. The Giants taking two out of three, losing the first one, and then winning the next two. So let's just get into it. The players I'm talking about for Saturday, Logan Webb was the starter and he was really good. Joey Bart and David VR hit homers. And then Camilo Duvall shut the door in the ninth inning. So notably, all four of those players I just mentioned are 25 years old and come with multiple seasons of club control. For Webb, he's 25. They're all 25. And Webb is only under club control for three additional seasons. So to me, this is something we will talk about a lot more when the offseason rolls around. But Webb is at the point where he's an extension candidate, in my opinion. And the way that this works is that you... Because right now, when you have three years of club control and you're Logan Webb, those three years are non-guaranteed for Webb. So he's arbitration eligible, and they could agree to a 2023 salary, and that would be guaranteed at a certain point. But then the next two years are not guaranteed. So if he gets hurt uh, or the performance just falls off a cliff, they the Giants don't owe him anything. He could be non-tendered. This is like very unlikely that this would happen. But what you do... As in terms of how does a deal get done, as you say, look, we're willing to buy out those three years, guarantee them, and also guarantee a couple more years for you. And in exchange for like the certainty of income for, say, a six year extension, meaning you buy out the three R beers and then three more free agent years at, at, you know, whatever value we would have to come up with some numbers here. Uh, For Webb, he gets the certainty of that commitment. And for the team, they get potentially a team-friendly deal where you, if it works out as you hope and Webb continues to be good, then you're getting this at an overall below market rate. And this is just kind of typical. And that's how these deals come together. And so he's reaching that point to me where he's an extension candidate because you don't want to let this guy hit free agency after three years and then leave. You want to keep him around. And so he's getting to the point where you start to think about that. But for the three other 25-year-olds that I just mentioned, they're nowhere near that point yet. So for Joey Bart, he entered the year with exactly one year of service time. You have to surpass six to get to free agency. And so that would mean five years counting this year, except he wasn't up all season long, right? He went to the minor leagues for about a month. And so He's not going to get to two full years of service time. So that would mean an additional five years of club control for Joey Bart after 2022. And so we'll get into like their numbers and their performance and all that in a minute. But I just want to mention the contract status. So for David VR, he's obviously a true rookie. And so any days on the active roster he spent are his first days this year. So he won't he will not get to a full year of service this year. He'll have less than one meaning six more years of club control for David Villar, the Giants have. And he, of course, is 25. For Camilo Doval, he entered the year with 125 days of service. So he's been on the roster all year. So he'll surpass the uh, one-year mark, meaning that he will have five years of club control remaining after 2022. God, it's hard to keep track of the years sometimes. So yeah, Camilo Duvall, five more years of club control after this year. So that is a good thing. When we talk about Duvall has kind of emerged, he's gotten a lot better with the sinker. And even though he's like sometimes inconsistent and sometimes has run into problems, he's got a 2.58 ERA on the season. And in his his career, 2.71. And his FIP this year, 3.14. Expected ERA, 3.03. So the numbers are all good, even though he's not quite a finished product. There's still some command shakiness at times. Gets him into trouble. We saw it last night, kind of just falling behind guys, getting into 3-0 counts. He kind of got, not lucky, but it was a little bit dicier than it seemed in that ninth inning. He got into a 3-1 count with a guy on and nobody out, and he ended up throwing a couple strikes and getting a double play. So the command isn't perfect, but overall, the numbers are just really good. And like I said, five years, you've got this guy. He's just turned 25 in July. So 
things are looking up, especially with that new sinker. It's clearly been an effective pitch for him, and it's great to have Duvall on the team and under club control for so many years. So, I mean, where to even go next? Logan Webb has established himself as a just really good pitcher in this league. 3.03 ERA last year. It's 2.88 this season. 2.88. He did have a like six runs taken off his ERA recently when a what was initially ruled a hit was changed to an error in Detroit by Brandon Crawford. I thought it was clearly an error at the time, but uh, it was ruled a hit and eventually they changed it and got it right and it took a bunch of runs off his ERA. So just pointing that out. But obviously Logan Webb is quite good and it's great to have a 25-year-old homegrown player who's been a development success he wasn't a top prospect and yet here he is pitching like one of the better pitchers in the game so that just goes to show you that these prospect rankings aren't necessarily gospel right because nobody necessarily saw this coming from Logan Webb and yet here he is so seven innings two runs against the Cubs and his previous start six innings two earned runs against the Dodgers so he's been pitching quite well here lately his last couple of outings, I mean, yeah, it was six unearned runs against the Tigers that came off the board there. So you all know it's great to have Logan Webb. But for Joey Bart, I just want to mention the season that he's had and what he's been able to do since being called back up. So since being called back up, he has a 123 weighted runs created plus. But the number that really stands out to me is that the strikeout rate is just 29.4%. That's still worse than average, and it's still somewhat high. It's actually pretty high. But before he was sent down, the strikeout rate was about 45%. So he's cut it from 45 to 29.4. And that is a big deal because you can't sustain striking out 45% of the time. But you can strike out 30% of the time and be okay. So I think that this 123 weighted runs created plus is still a little bit inflated. Because there's a somewhat unsustainably high 354 average on balls in play that is pulling that up. And if that comes down a little bit, the overall numbers are going to come down. But importantly, he's been able to get to his power more. And I think it has more to do with just making better contact and just being able to make contact with the baseball. So that 202 isolated power, which is just slugging minus batting average, is significantly better than league average. And he's hit seven home runs in 136 plate appearances since being called back up. So I'm not here. A lot of people are saying he needs to be hitting higher in the lineup. I don't necessarily agree. I think it's he's still not, I'm not seeing like superstar bat when I look at these numbers. And when I watch him, there's still a lot of chase. There's a lot of swing and miss. There's a lot of strikeout. So I'm fine with him hitting towards the bottom of the lineup. But it's been a good developmental year for Joey Bart overall and defensively and just personality wise and leadership wise, he's really come into his own. And this has been an important season of growth for him. David VR is one of the more important players to watch down the stretch here. He does have some good mixed in with some bad. There's still, there's not a lot of contact. The contact rate is just 62.8% on the season for Joey Bart by way of, by way of example, his contact rate is 64.6%. So uh, VR is making less contact than Joey Bart. And the chase rate has been good for David VR. He doesn't chase like Joey Bart, but there's not enough contact. And the strikeout rate as a result is 34%. So worse than Bart since getting called back up, but better than Bart overall in the season. So VR did hit this home run on Saturday. It was great to see. He's gotten to some power. He had a good road trip overall. He hit three home runs in LA, including two in one game. Hit this home run in Chicago as well. Can't remember if VR hit a home run in Milwaukee. I don't think so. But overall, it's been a solid showing here for David VR lately. But I need to see more. And that's why it's really important to see how he fares down the stretch to see if he can become a piece that looks like a vital piece part of the 2023 Giants and beyond. But the beauty is he's got three minor league options, so it's not something that has to happen now. He could always next year be sent down and get called back up. He's clearly on the radar and is going to be given some opportunities, and this these next three-plus weeks will be vital for him. So coming up in just a minute, Dom Leone 
placed on unconditional release waivers. What does it mean? And what is the bullpen looking like these days for the Giants? It is in major transition mode. We'll get into it in just a minute. But first. All right, as promised, Dom Leone placed on unconditional release waivers. What does it mean? And what is the state of the Giants bullpen that has been in a in a lot of fluctuation lately? Also, I meant to get in get into Tyro Estrada, who had a big game on Sunday. And he's not 25, so I, I kind of meant to lump him into that conversation. But he's 26, and he has a lot of years of club control remaining as well. He entered this year with one year, 158 days of service. So he will have more than surpassed the two years of service mark, meaning four years of club control remaining for Tyro Estrada starting in 2023. So it's been a good season for Tyro Estrada. He's put together 2.3 Fangraphs wins above replacement in 468 plate appearances, 18 stolen bases on the season, caught just four times with 13 home runs. So real chance to get to 15 homers, 15 plus steals on the season. And to me, he struggled at times defensively, but I've said this repeatedly. He's not a guy I think should struggle defensively. He's got quite a bit of range. He's got a good arm. He's just kind of struggled at times to like get the ball in the glove and have it stick there. Sometimes it's rattled around and popped out, but he's athletic enough that I think he should be good defensively. And we've seen it kind of stabilize in the last couple months. I think he's been good at second base. He's been fine at shortstop. He's a guy who can play shortstop for you, which is nice. They haven't really had that kind of true backup to Brandon Crawford. And yet Estrada has been able to do that in the last couple of months at least. I mean, he's done it at times throughout the whole year and last year. But to me, he's kind of stabilized in that it, he's kind of taken over that role and it's clear that he can handle it. So he's just 26 years old, as I said. So the athleticism and the speed, you don't necessarily worry about going anywhere anytime soon. He is a guy who makes a lot of contact. We mentioned David Villar's contact rate in the low 60s. This is the percent of pitches that you swing at that you make contact on. So for Estrada this year, he's at 81.3%. And for his career, 80.5%. I believe league average is kind of mid-70s, so it's above average contact. Strikeout rate is just 16.7%. That is significantly better than average. And he's just been more or less an everyday player for the Giants. In his Giants career, he's got a 107 weighted runs created plus with 34 Fangraphs wins above replacement in 600, exactly 600 plate appearances for the Giants. So that's how, even though the bat has been similar in overall value to Wilmer Flores, he's put up more kind of production per 600 plate appearances because of the superior base running and defense. So that's kind of an example there of how that works. And in terms of platoon splits, I remember early in the year, he was not doing as well against uh uh, left-handed pitching, as you would expect, but doing better against right-handed pitching. And they kind of platooned him a little bit, and we were wondering why, and thinking it probably was that they believed that over time he would actually be better against lefties. And that's kind of what happened. what's happened here. So in his Giants career, he actually has a 118 weighted runs created plus against lefties, and against righties is just 101. So Again, it's not a guy who needs to be platooned because he's giving you the defensive value, the base running b value, and has held his own against same-handed pitching, but he has been more dangerous against left-handed pitching, just to make that point. But again, another mid-20s player under club control, it's a good thing that these guys have kind of established themselves this year. Dom Leon, a guy who established himself last year, but not so much this year. Just like so many guys in the bullpen, he was so good in in 2021 as the Giants led the majors with bull, in bullpen ERA at 2.99. This year just hasn't been that way. Last year, Leon had a 151 ERA. This year, it was 401. So many runs higher. And he was placed on unconditional release waivers after going on the IL with an elbow impingement. So Leon is a free agent at the end of the year. This is part of the reason why they like to have roster flexibility with the bullpen they don't like to get locked into guys 
And Leon is a perfect example. You might be good one year and then bad the next. How about Brebia? He was bad last year and then good this year. So, so it goes with bullpens a lot of the time. They do have a pretty full and deep, I mean, deep is not necessarily the right word. They have a pretty full bullpen with Doval, Brebia, Rogers, Alex Young has kind of established himself as a part of this pen. Luis Ortiz is being given a look here. He's a young player who's important to watch down the stretch if they're going to give him this opportunity. Scott Alexander, I thought, has really established himself as a guy that could be an important part of the future Giants bullpen. And Junior Marte is being given a lot of looks as well. So not necessarily going to work out for all these guys, but it's important to give guys a look, guys who could be a part of next year and beyond. Whereas Leon was a free agent at the end of the year, think they already knew what they were getting out of him and they probably aren't going to bring him back and so it made sense to just send him on his way hope for his sake that he can catch on with another team to get to kind of give an audition in the last few months but the Giants have seen enough and it doesn't really make sense to play these guys in your pen who aren't going to be a part of next year's bullpen when you have these younger guys and it's worth just giving them an opportunity. So you could make a case that that might be true for some guys on the offensive side as well. But they don't have a, I mean, Brandon Belt is already on the injured list. Jock Peterson would be the guy. Like he's a free agent at the end of the year, but he's playing well enough. You can't really justify just taking him out. But he's another guy. I wouldn't be surprised if they try to extend him a la Wilmer Flores. So anyway, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen today. Now make your second listen to the Locked on MLB podcast. MLB expert Paul Francis Sullivan brings humor, passion, and unique perspective on every team and the biggest stories around the league. Follow the number one daily league-wide podcast, Locked on MLB, on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out a lot, so thanks in advance. And thank you to everyone who's done so already. Coming up tonight, Giants versus Braves back in San Francisco. Tough matchup. Braves are good. They're fighting to try to get uh, to into first place in the NL East. And so it's a huge series for the Braves. Every game is huge for them at this point. So Giants can play spoiler, and I hope that they ratchet up the intensity and can go toe-to-toe with this defending World Series champion team. Anyway, can't wait to be with you again tomorrow. Thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.